All right. Thanks, Katie. Uh, my name is Melissa Kay, and I am so happy that all of you are here for the Air Sensory Integration Conversation number three. And tonight's topic is sensory reactivity. So we've had, uh, this is the third of three talks. The first was a more general theoretical talk. The second focused on praxis. And tonight's topic, as I said, is sensory reactivity. How we will proceed is that I will um, do a short presentation, probably about 25 minutes, and then after that, there'll be time for questions. So um, please save your questions and um, jot them down. And once I am done with the presentation, which is pretty much designed to um, re-familiarize you and, and kind of trigger your memory about module one, then we can um, then we can move forward from there with any questions that you might have about mod one or anything else that I can help with. Sound okay? Okay. So uh, we're going to start with a little bit of a terminology review. If this is old old hat for you, um, please bear with me for, for just a minute. And um, if it is uh, not so familiar, then it's just a little preparation for the rest of the lecture. So this terminology on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see um, a number of terms that are related to sensory reactivity, and on the right, a description of those terms. So we start with the most basic idea of sensory registration, which is simply detecting relevant sensation. And then we move on to orientation, which is kind of a, a focusing or preparing to respond to sensation. Arousal is the level of alertness that an individual has. Reactivity is their response to sensations. And because we're talking about sensory reactivity, we're largely talking about um, reactions or responses that are atypical or in some way are, um, are problematic for the individual that's experiencing them. And then uh, we'll also be uh, looking at self-regulation. And on this slide, I've just um, talked about uh, five, uh, four different types, or five different types, excuse the, the comma that's missing, um, physiological self-regulation, sensory motor, emotional, cognitive, there should be a comma there, and then behavioral. And we're going to look at self-regulation a little bit more right now. So self-regulation, and this work is from uh, Kimberly Barthel, who's uh, Canadian, and it was a way that I really could make sense of self-regulation. You know, for those of us that are that are working um, in pediatrics and um, and most especially in school-based practice, we get asked the question a lot. Uh, is it sensory or is it behavioral? And what Kimberly Barthel would say is that um, self-regulation has a number of parts. It has the sensory piece, so sensory self-regulation. We also have an emotional piece, so we can self-regulate emotionally. And if you think to yourself, you know, about a time where you were um, emotionally upset or emotionally quite happy or emotionally um, very flat, um, you know that your self-regulation or your response to the world and, the, and your also your internal um, workings can vary quite a bit um, due to emotional input. And finally, there's also cognitive self-regulation. So that piece is what our um, what our brains tell us, right, and how our thoughts impact how we're reacting to the world and to our internal states. So for today's lecture, um, we're going to focus primarily on sensory self-regulation, but do know that there's a number of different kinds of self-regulation and that sensory self-regulation is actually impacted by our emotional states and also our cognitive states. 
So in the, um, in the module, in module one, self-regulation is talked about quite a bit. And, and again, we're back to sensory self-regulation. And we think about um, our psychological systems responding uh, either adaptively or not adaptively um, to um, sensory input. Um, we can see it in terms of impulse control, uh, self-control, our self-management, our sense of independence. We can also see it in terms of how motivated we are, how um, our behaviors and emotional control are either kind of under our control or not. And then in our cognitive systems, in terms of our ability to attend, to think, to problem solve, and to engage independently. When we think about self-regulation, um, we think about a continuum from early in life to um, young adulthood, starting with the formation of effective relationships and attachment. So attachment and self-regulation go together, especially um, in very young children and, in, and infants. And to start with, um, our caregivers actually are providing quite a bit of our self-regulation in terms of co-regulation. Then as we develop communication skills and the ability to contr control internal states, that idea of self-regulation becomes more independent and more rooted in the child than in the parent. And some of that um, piece where we separate from our, from our parent, um, you know, when we're really young, I'm thinking like Erickson's um, two-year-old phase, right, where, or the, uh, um, the terrible twos where a child says no, 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 no to everything. That kind of separation is also signaling that our self-regulation is moving from a caregiver-mediated state to an internal state. And then, um, you know, we develop an understanding of cause and effect. Sensory input produces a result. And finally, the development of self-initiated organized behaviors. So there's a lot to self-regulation. I'm going to leave it at that for now. Um, but consider that, um, that it's a complex phenomenon and it's influenced by a lot of different factors. Then we move on to arousal, which again is our state of alertness. And when we think about arousal, I actually have three different slides that look at arousal in related but slightly different ways. So the first is, um, is a diagram that uh, many people have seen in terms of how alert you are um, in relationship to how efficient you are or how connected and, um, and able to be present and engaged in occupation one might be. So you see on the left side of the screen, um, they call it a coma state, um, but it's very, very low arousal. And that's a zone of relaxation. We might be unmotivated, disinterested, or inefficient because our arousal level is so low. The middle zone of alertness is actually where um, both children and adults are capable of approaching, exploring, um, expressing excitement and feeling excitement about a task, and also being interested. And then we get to the right side of this slide, which is the zone of anxiety. So we've gone to a state of high alertness or high arousal, and it's actually over alert or over aroused, and we see behaviors like avoidance, defensiveness, um, disinterest because of overwhelm, and being inefficient in what we're trying to do. Another way of looking at the process of arousal is from um, Berenick, and, um, and she talks about this optimal engagement band. So if you think that um, on the bottom, you know, if you think about sort of um, uh, a graph with waves on it, at the bottom is, um, is very low arousal, and so we have poor attention and processing and little responsiveness. The optimal engagement band, as you can see from the, um, the phrases that are there, is where we actually can engage with, um, with learning, with other people, with 
um, tasks and activities and occupationally. And then um, there's also a high threshold where we again become inattentive um, and also avoidant and reject sensation. And so we're overstimulated and aversive to sensation. And finally, um, this visual is um, from Gustavo Reynoso, um, and he talks about low arousal and high arousal, as we saw in the last two slides, but adds another dimension, which is the positive behaviors that are associated with low and high arousal and also the negative. So you see on the left side, there's the two little plus signs. On the right side, the two little minus signs. And I won't go through each of the terms with you, but you could see that um, both with low and high arousal, there is some positive behaviors and some negative behaviors. And so as with a lot of sensory reactivity or overreactivity, we actually um, don't really need to do much for the individual that might be slightly low arousal or slightly high arousal and is not experiencing any of the negative repercussions, right? So it's on a continuum and the times that we want to assess and intervene with individuals is when they have those types of behaviors and reactions that are on the right side of this slide. Okay, so just a very brief review of who has sensory reactivity. We know that a very high percentage of individuals on the autism spectrum uh, have sensory reactivity in addition to other autistic symptoms. ADHD, Fragile X syndrome, also kids with cerebral palsy can be quite um, quite defensive or have high reactivity um, to sensation. There's a, a variety of other diagnoses that may elicit sensory reactivity in addition to the um, primary diagnosis. And then there's a whole school of, or a whole population of kids and adults who have sensory reactivity in isolation from any other diagnosis. In other words, the sensory reactivity is idiopathic. We don't know exactly where it came from or why it's present, but it is here. And I've seen um, percentages anywhere from about 7 or 8 percent all the way up to about 16 percent of individuals across the board um, being identified as having sensory reactivity. So let's look at some broad categories of sensory reactivity. First we have the, the individual, and I, and I say individual as opposed to child because we do see adults and, um, and teens that also have um, sensory reactivity issues. And, you know, in my practice, I'm an occupational therapist um, in pediatrics, I get asked pretty frequently um, is this going to go away or is my child going to grow out of it? And the answer um, to a large extent is no, actually not. Um, what we see is that as, uh, as kids grow up, they may develop a set of either adaptive or maladaptive or both um, kinds of ways of coping and compensating for sensory reactivity, but the issue doesn't go away on its own, and that's where air sensory integration comes in, as well as a number of other kinds of um, methods and strategies for addressing sensory reactivity. So back to our overreactive individual, and this is the, um, this is the child or adult who has defensiveness. In other words, their nervous system has a low firing point, and so sensation that doesn't bother or irritate or cause um, a painful uh, sensation to the average person actually is noxious to this individual. Um, the Overreactivity or defensiveness can be in any of the sensory systems, but we especially see it in the tactile system, the vestibular system, the, the auditory system, and the um, olfactory and gustatory or smell and taste systems. 
We can also see it in terms of um, manifesting as visual distractibility, and it's linked with attention deficits um, because if you're constantly being extremely bothered by sensation in your environment and in your body, it's really, really hard to pay attention. And this is typically the kid that gets um, referred for service, right? Because they cannot stand to be in their clothes, in their skin, in their classroom, et cetera. Then we have the individual who's underreactive. So they have diminished behavioral responses to sensation. They might also have a limited awareness of sensation and um, they don't explore the environment, and, and we know with little kids this is particularly um, an issue because the way young children learn is by exploring their environment. So there's a decreased um, engagement with the environment due to this underreactivity. These kids don't necessarily get identified as early or as frequently um, because the underreactivity manifests as a kid who's not really causing any difficulty, right? So they're the quiet kid that just kind of sits there. Um, contrast that with the overreactive child who actually is so uncomfortable that they're making a fuss a lot of the time or having a, a series of either avoidant or um, controlling behaviors that manifest um, in some cases pretty loudly. Okay, so third, um, we have the sensory seeking kid. And this is the child that um, may be um, thrill or adventure seeking um, they seek experiences that are outside of what's conventional for um, a kid of their age. They um, may be uh, seem disinhibited, so they're running from one thing to another and having a difficult time persisting with any task. Um, they also um, tend to want to escape the situation that they're in so that they can go and seek more sensation and they have a really low tolerance for boredom or repetition or sameness. So this is the kid that may have poor safety awareness um, or be a daredevil because they're seeking sensation. And underlying that is, um, is a mechanism where sensation is not being processed effectively. And so the sensation that they're craving is not actually meeting their sensory needs. And then finally, um, and, and it, fluctuating reactivity is not necessarily um, a, a separate category, but it kind of represents the child or adult who um, has some sensitivities, may have some seeking behaviors, may have some underreactivity. And those of us that um, have been working um, with children with sensory um, processing and integration issues have seen this, that, that some of the systems are overactive and others are underactive or the child is seeking. And so um, we can see um, problems with rest and sleep, with stress, um, with a variety of, of areas that affect um, or are the outcomes of fluctuating reactivity. And so those are four kind of um, broad categories of um, sensory reactivity. And I want to just review briefly um, the ideas of habituation and sensitization that are underneath um, the idea of sensory reactivity. So habituation is often defined as a decrease in behavioral response during repeated presentations of sensation. So in other words, if um, the individual is exposed to a particular kind of sensation over and over and over again, they it becomes uh, habituated and they stop responding so much. Sensitization, on the other hand, is that um, with repeated exposures, um, there's actually enhanced behaviors 
um, after strong or noxious stimuli. So the person's behavioral response becomes stronger over time. And habituation, um, when, it's, when it's occurring in the, in the typical individual, um, takes noxi noxious stimuli and kind of dampens it down. Sensitization is what often happens to individuals who have sensory defensiveness. So rather than habituating to it, they either don't habituate, so it remains at the same magnitude as it was for the first um, exposure, or they become even more sensitized to it. So it's part of the mechanism that underlies sensory defensiveness. And again, we bring up sensory defensiveness because um, it is one of the um, most frequent and also most uncomfortable situations that we encounter with the clients that we treat. Okay, so uh, we'll take a, a very brief look at assessment and then move on to an overview of intervention and then it will be your turn. I'm imagining I have probably about seven or eight more minutes of lecture just to give you kind of a, uh, some insight into that. And again, this is a broad overview and, and review. So there's a number of factors that we look at when we assess an individual for sensory reactivity. And always, 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 we want to precede any kind of treatment or intervention with a thorough assessment, because without knowing exactly what's going on, um, we cannot effectively treat any of our clients. And in fact, um, Glenn Gillen, I just read the latest issue of OT Practice, and Glenn Gillen came out with a set of um, circumstances in which um, we really want to be cautious about treating. And one of them was exactly this, that, um, that kids get treated for sensory processing and integration issues without a thorough assessment. So um, if you want more info on that, I can point you in the direction of, of that particular article. I found it super interesting. It just came in the mail a couple days ago. In any case, um, so when we look at the child that has sensory reactivity or the adult, um, we first want to look at their health status and their stress. There's a number of medical issues that can um, create a situation where there is sensory reactivity. Um, they can uh, involve an immunological state, um, poor nutrition, poor metabolism, allergies, seizures, GI difficulties, and we see that quite a lot in kids on the autism spectrum, um, sleep disturbances or apnea, or endocrine or neuroendocrine functions. So there's a lot of health issues that manifest as um, sensory reactivity, and we really want to be careful about that and about treating the issue, the underlying issue. Also, stress can exacerbate any kind of sensory reactivity. Next is um, in assessment is doing clinical observations of the child um, at the very least in the clinical environment, um, but more, uh, even more effectively in their natural environment, whether it's their school environment, their home environment, community environment. So we want to see what they're like in the real world. We also want to look at their state of self-regulation, and we talked about that quite a bit at the beginning of the lecture. So we want to take all of those factors into account and, and really carefully assess that, as well as their co-regulation. In other words, how do the adults or caregivers in their life um, help them with regulation? Caregiver reports are another important way of getting information, um, and so occupational interviews can be a good way to do that. And I realize that we have at least one physical therapist, I believe, who's present. So um, I, my apologies for not including you explicitly, but I do know you're here. Um, so thanks for bearing with the, the OT-based um, lecture. And finally, there's a set of standardized um, evaluations, and they're not um, 
most of them are not direct evaluations like the SIPT, although there are parts of the SIPT that can give us information about sensory reactivity. Primarily what we're looking at is um, measures like the sensory processing measure and the sensory profile. So we always want to be cautious in interpreting um, sensory reactivity from questionnaires because it's not actually information that is coming directly from the child. And you know, I would add to, to this list that if we can talk to the child about how they are doing and how they are feeling and what's difficult for them inside and outside their body, that can also give us some valuable information. And thanks, Anna. All right. So that's an overview of assessment, and now we turn to approaches to intervention. And what I'm going to do is give you a, a very high-level overview of the range of interventions that exist for us, um, including ASI, but not limited to ASI. So what we want to look at first is lifestyle. Um, What's the child's environment like? What's their stress level like? Again, how's their nutrition? How's their exercise level? Um, what sort of socialization and social network do they have? And are they getting adequate opportunities to play? So there's a lot that enters into lifestyle, and I'm not saying that it can make or break sensory reactivity, but what we, what I know, I'll speak for myself, is after treating, um, you know, many, many children with sensory reactivity is that um, a single approach is not as powerful as a comprehensive approach. And the comprehensive approach most definitely includes looking at comprehensively at the child's um, engagement across the board in his or her life. Okay. And then we have therapeutic activities, and this is where um, air sensory integration really comes to the fore. So having um, AIRS SI in a clinical uh, setting is crucially important in, um, in my estimation to helping children who have sensory reactivity. We can also look at sensory diets, um, using inhibitory and alerting activities at home and in the school or community environment, using novelty to engage children, increasing heavy work, in other words, proprioceptive activities across the board, grading sensory challenges, so that's where um, the just right challenge and the adaptive response come into the picture, and then planning routines strategically. So we want to, um, you know, we want to be very careful about how much excitement and how much downtime kids have, especially when they have sensory reactivity. I know that, you know, even as a person who does not have any sort of pathological sensory reactivity, um, I am a person who um, gets really um, kind of overwhelmed and um, and overloaded with sensation, or I can, if, if my environment is very busy and there's a lot of sound and a lot of sights. I was just at a convention over the weekend, and at certain points I just had to take myself out of that very busy environment with lots and lots of sensory stimulation and go into a lower um, excitement environment and take a rest. So in terms of therapeutic activities, that balance of excitement and downtime it can also be very important. Okay, another aspect of intervention is something uh, that Suzanne calls change the rules in her, um, in her lecture. And I love this one. So, you know, there's, there's um, cultural and societal norms about how we need to do activities that we're doing in our daily lives. And change the rules um, means things as simple as rather than forcing a child to sit and work when they're doing tabletop activities, what if we allow them to stand? What if we allow them to use other kinds of seating options? 
what if we allow them to move while they're working? What if we allow them to use oral stimulation while they're working? And what if we alter the length of time that we're requiring an individual to spend on each task, right? So rather than trying to change the individual's nervous system and that firing point that, um, that kicks them over from, um, from typical arousal level to over aroused or leaves them in the under aroused state, what if we change the rules so that we actually were accommodating their state and allowing it to, um, with, with assistance and with this idea of changing things up, we were allowing them to more fully participate in a more comfortable way. And then there's cognitive regulation. So to my mind, a great example of this is the kid that is really poorly regulated, but really smart. So I often use this in addition to the, to the rest of my tools in my toolbox to help kids um, with sensory reactivity. And what it means is um, increasing or helping the child increase their self-awareness of what's going on inside and outside their body, um, identifying regulatory strategies, linking the feelings inside and outside their body with strategies that they can use to change this, um, learning to anticipate difficult situations so that they can better deal with them or avoid them in some cases, using strategies during challenging situations or times, and linking language um, between regulatory states and levels of alertness, and two programs that many of us are familiar with that do this very nicely are the alert program for self-regulation and the zones of regulation. So we're um, then using a metaphor for, um, for reactivity and enabling the child to start associating how they feel with what's going on and what they can do about it, either independently or with the assistance of an adult or caregiver. And finally, we have environmental modification as a means for intervening. So there's a lot of ways that we can change the context or the environment that the child is in so that um, they either are um, upregulated or downregulated. And some of these include um, modifying the degree and the intensity of the qualities of the physical environment or the social environment, um, altering the timing or the sequencing of interactions that happen within the environment, increasing the interest or the challenge while decreasing the sensory demands within the environment, uh, changing the position of items in the environment, like furniture or equipment. Also, we have a special ability to modify or grade the environment or the activity to be less distracting, less anxiety provoking, or more accessible. And again, this is the just right challenge coming into play. We can also increase within any environment opportunities for movement and muscle work, and we can decrease distractions. Um, you know, these oftentimes, especially in uh, the earlier years, um, are manifested by classrooms that are particularly visually distracting, but they also might be auditorily distracting. They might have a lot of smells or there might be a lot of light and unexpected touch happening in the environment. So as ASI professionals, we can help quite a bit um, in this area. Final thoughts include um, allowing the child to arrive or leave before everyone else does, and alerting that child to trans upcoming transitions, and providing some time for the child to orient to to the surroundings before demanding that he or she interact. Okay, so um, last slide. So in summary, sensory reactivity, which is the term that we're using because it's what the DSM-5 uses, 
Um, and being on the same page with the same sort of language is helpful when we're talking to other professionals. So sensory reactivity is the term that we're using, um, is linked with arousal and behavioral regulation, and it's a complex topic. Um, reactivity um, has been identified in children with and without additional diagnosis. Um, it can be linked with a number of different kinds of dysfunction that take place in different parts of the brain. And we didn't go down that path, um, but notable areas include the reticular formation, the limbic structures, the hypothalamus, and the stress response systems and neurotransmitters. And, um, you know, there's a lot of attention on this area. Um, more so than there is on praxis, which is um, something that we need to work on in our field. But there's, even though there, it's widely researched and there's a lot of attention on it, there's still quite a bit to learn. So now is your turn to, um, to ask any questions that you might have, and I'm happy to field them. You can either ask um, verbally through your microphone, or you can type the questions, and I'll do my best to get to all of them in the order that they were asked. And thanks for your attention during the lecture. I see uh, Lauren's hand raised. Can you hear me? I sure can. OK, great. Um, I just have a question just to clarify the difference between underreactivity and sensory seeking. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about the, the types of sensory reactivity, um, I'm, you know, I know for overreactivity, you said they have a low firing point. Sure. Um, and then for for underreactivity and and sensory seeking, would you say that those kids have the they both would have the higher threshold or the higher firing point? You know, for the child, that's that's a great question, Lauren, and um, and it's a good distinction to make and get familiar with. What I would say is for the children, children that are under responsive, they have a very high firing point. And um, what we, um, you know, a, an example would be a child with Down syndrome that has very low um, low arousal, and it takes a lot to get that kid going. Um, if that if that's a useful um, analogy for you. Sensory seeking, on the other hand, um, to my understanding, is not necessarily that the firing point is super high, but that additional brain structures and processing is not happening effectively. So it may be a higher firing point, but it also has to do with the processing of sensation. Right, so the input may be getting in at the level of the sensory receptors, um, but when it goes up to the brain and, and through the, the um, spinal tracts, it's not registering as, um, as the intensity of sensation that actually is happening. And one example of this to give you kind of a, a, a mental picture would be the child that gets on a swing and they swing and swing and swing and swing and swing, and they're not meeting their vestibular, their need for vestibular input. So, um, so it could be that they have a high firing uh, range, but in some instances, when we take that child and we do a post-rotary and a stagment test, they actually are experiencing the um, post-rotary nystagmus, right? So the, so the eye flicks or eye movements, However, the brain is not registering the input. So I would say the sensory seeking can happen at various, um, various other um, levels within the brain. Does that help? Yes, that helps a lot. Thank you so much. Sure. Other questions? Um, Okay, so I see a question from Maria and then one from Aja. So um, I will take Maria's question first. Could you clarify the correlation between sensory modulation and sensory gating? Does it just refer to overreactivity? Um, so Maria, um, I'm not going uh, to say without a shadow of a doubt that this is what's going on. But with sensory gating, 
Um, it is with overreactivity for sure, um, but it can also be with underreactivity. So typically we think about gating as the amount of sensation that's getting through. Um, and I would say that that can occur um, when not enough is getting through or when too much sen sensation is getting through. Does that help? Sure. Okay, and Asia's question, the chart on the process of arousal, the ARC, is that a chart you created? I really like the levels that include zones of relaxation, curiosity, and anxiety. Um, no, that came from, uh, I wish I could claim it, but it came from um, the zones of curiosity. And if you just Google that, um, that's where it came from. And I've seen it a lot of different ways. You know, I, I teach um, at the university level, and, um, and so I present it to my students as well um, in a slightly different um, configuration. But basically, like, if you're too bored, if you're just right, or if you've been cramming all night and today is the final, right? So, um, so those levels, I find, um, go across a variety of um, a variety of kind of contexts, and I'm glad you like it. Um, okay, and Katie asks, is gravitational insecurity a vestibular discrimination overreactivity issue? Um, yes, it is an over a vestibular overreactivity issue. I would not. I would not apply, Katie, um, the word discrimination to vestibular. Um, I consider um, discrimination to be most likely and most effectively applied to the tactile system or the somatosensory system. Um, but that, um, you know, that terminology aside, it definitely is an overreactivity issue. Um, it's a little bit different than, um, than vestibular defensiveness. Right, so it um, it also gravitational insecurity um, also pulls in the visual system, right? So we have the situation, for example, where a kid is walking onto the playground and it's made up of a bunch of those um, pieces of foam that make playgrounds very very squishy, so nobody gets sued when you fall down, and um, and it's not very um, bumpy or uneven, but it's perceived that way. So we know that the vestibular and the visual system work very closely in concert with each other. And so gravitational insecurity, while primarily a visual a vestibular issue, is also impacted by the visual system because the visual system is not helping in saying, hey, even though the vestibular system thinks this is crazy, um, I know it's not. The, vis the visual system is not helping to, um, to calm the, um, the overarching issue. Does that help? Great. And research, uh, Lauren asks about research looking at w whether there is a genetic component to sensory reactivity. That's a super interesting question. You know, um, with so much um, having to do with sensory integration, sensory processing, sensory reactivity, um, we, we just kind of don't know. And so the genetic component, I would say, um, is we know more and more that the genetic component is present when it's a concomitant diagnosis like autism. So there was a very big study, I believe it came out of um, uh, University uh, uh, UCSF, University of California, San Francisco. Um, it was a giant twin study, and it was twins with autism, and they found that there was quite a lot of, um, of genetic, uh, shared genetic issues between twins um, because if one twin had autism, the other one a lot of times did as well. Um, I am not sure about genetic component to sensory reactivity if it's idiopathic, um, but I will um, put it on my list of things to do and, um, and then forward it to Katie what I find out. So I will get back to you on that question. And um, Sue or Asia, if you have um, insights, I'd love to hear them. 
So Asia says Mary Schneider's research with primates suggests that there may be a genetic component. Okay, um, thank you for that question. And um, what else would you like to know about? And Maria, I'm taking a minute to read your um, your question since it's a little bit long. Ah, uh, so. Yeah, uh, um, you're focusing on sensory gating. And um, from my perspective, while sensory gating is a piece of the puzzle, it's not, um, it's not like maybe as central um, an issue. Uh, it's more underlying. Um, and so I, I tend to not focus it on it as much as you are. Now that may be absolutely, um, incorrect and in reality um, I'm missing a big piece of the puzzle and if so um, I'm sure Suzanne or Zoe will listen to this and let me know. Um, however, uh, I think what you're asking um, is why does treatment work? Why does treating sensory modulation work? Does it, does it improve the sensory gating? And by sensory gating and you tell me if I'm understanding you correctly, um, you're using that term to be the, um, the firing of action potentials within the nervous system with the idea that if one is overreactive or defensive, in other words, um, the gating, uh, the gating uh, or the action potentials have a very low firing um, level. And if one is underreactive, the um, firing potentials are very high. So how do we change that? So is that the actual question that you're asking? And I don't mean to put words in your mouth. So if it's not, try me again. Thanks for bearing with us, everyone. And you know, yeah, most definitely it takes time. So um, in the absence of um, confirmation of, of what you're asking, um, if the question really is, can we can we change the um, the firing threshold within the nervous system? Um, the answer is yes. That is the very most um, core piece of what sensory integration therapy or air sensory integration therapy seeks to do is to neurologically change the. Um, firing level and the responsivity of the nervous system and also further to um, to change some of the patterns of processing and integrating sensation. So that is the goal and um, you know and um, Dr. Ayers uh, looked at um, sensory integration as uh, what we call a, a bottom-up kind of approach in part. 
And that bottom-up approach was actually affecting the nervous system itself so that sensory, this one's um, self-regulation um, was altered. Therefore, their reactions and responses were altered. Therefore, their behavior could change. Okay, so she says um, she was observing one child who reacted always on the same stimuli so strongly without any changes in his behavior. Yeah, so and Asia says with sensory integration theory, we hypothesize that we change the way that sensation is processed in the nervous system, but right now it is conjecture. I have not seen research to directly prove this idea, however. Um, me neither. However, it's what, um, you know, it is um, part of the core of the theory. And um, because we don't understand it entirely, um, and it does not, um, you know, the, the nervous system doesn't actually change in all instances, especially if you have a child who has super strong behavioral reactions um, to sensory stimuli. That goes, that kind of harkens back to um, some of the other kinds of intervention strategies that we use. Um, because what we know is that we can't just get in there with a, um, you know, with a therapeutic screwdriver and tighten some things up and loosen some other things and have that child be changed. We also have a lot of questions about um, what frequency of intervention, what intensity of intervention, and the therapeutic activities that for particular, um, particular sensory reactivity challenges, which particular activities um, are the most effective. So a lot more questions than answers. And anecdotally, what we know is that um, we can help children, right? So um, we have successes in changing um, the behavioral outcomes of sensory processing in kids with sensory reactivity. Thank you, Asia. So, um, Maria, maybe you can write down um, um, Patty Davies and Shula Perush. Yep, I see that it was the same question. Okay, um, we have about five minutes left and um, I'd like to open it up to other participants if you, um, if you have questions. And someone wrote in with a couple questions that I will, um, I will also introduce if you don't have questions, but since you're here and present, um, I'd like to I'd like to hear from anyone else that has questions right now. Well, if you think of something, please write it down. And in the interim, um, I'm just going to address uh, two questions that were emailed in. The first has to do with the relationship between food allergies and the vestibular system. Um, this uh, student says, the realization of allergies that affect the ear I have clear, but not other allergies such as food. So I think that um, what the student is referring to is um, when kids have food allergies, how does that impact the, um, the, the well working of the vestibular system? So what we know is that any time um, food allergies result in mucus buildup, which um, for a lot of kids is um, dairy, um, foods that have gluten in them, and a variety of other, other kinds of things that may cause um, mucus buildup and congestion and inflammation, um, 
those can impact the vestibular system. So the vestibular system and the auditory system, as you, as you well know by now, um, share a physical space and also some neurological connections. And any time um, those um, apparatuses are stuffed up, for lack of a better word, or inflamed in some way, it's going to impact the working of the vestibular system. Case in point would be um, if you have a really bad cold and your sinuses are congested and um, your vestibular or auditory uh, canals are also congested, you lose your sense of balance and you can experience um, uh, symptoms. So food allergies in some children can do the same thing if they, um, if they are related to either causing inflammation or, um, or fluid or mucus buildup. And the second question um, is related, uh, this question I'm not entirely sure of, so if the, if the student um, can confirm or if I'm not ans answering the, the actual question, please do let me know, or Katie. Um, it's about the relationship between the somatosensory system and the idea of lateral inhibition. And, um, the, and then that related to lateral somatosensory and the perception of two points. And um, to address that, uh, what I did was some research on this idea of uh, somatosensory processing and lateral inhibition. And what I found was an article, a 2017 article, that, that very nicely kind of sums up the relationship between um, motor skill and somatosensory input. So the idea with this, with this lateral inhibition, meaning um, two sides of the body and inhibiting or holding back, that when uh, that somatosensory um, receptors are all over our bodies, right? So if we touch something, for example, with our right hand but not our left hand, um, it's going to affect what happens in terms of our motor activity. So if there's sensation coming in through our right hand, we're going to likely respond with our right hand in a motoric way. And the article explains this whole um, kind of cascade of effects um, and studies it pretty closely. So um, we'll forward that to you. But um, for the student that asked about that, um, it has to do with uh, the connection to the motor system and how um, inhibition is related to motor competency. All right, um, it's a little bit odd to be talking without seeing your faces either look, looking particularly puzzled or smiling and nodding, um, but hopefully uh, this has been a helpful session for you. I am happy to hear from you outside of the session, and I'll just put up my contact information on the last slide. Uh, if you have other questions or need more info, you can feel free to email me um, at melissak13 at gmail.com. And I thank you so much for attending the session and for your time and best wishes to you in your studies.